There we go. Happy Monday afternoon and good to see you for another Office Hours Live with Dr. C. I hope you're doing well. Yeah, we got summer going and uh, what a crazy world we're in. <laughs> what an unusual time it's been. Yeah, nice to nice to connect. And uh, general format for these, hey class, we have good to see you. Yeah, nice to see some old friends jumping on here already. So yeah, I'll get a couple of these earlier questions and go deep in those and have a good conversation. I'll also just mention some recent topics that have come up and things that are top of mind. You know, I don't know, I guess the big overall picture is uh, I'm always so impressed at how much capacity the body has to fix itself. And I'm always just amazed at there being more potential than we would have thought. You know, I, I just shared, we'll see this come out in a, about another week or so, but I just shared the cover for the next book and spent about the last year looking at the medical research on thyroid disease, like pretty much nonstop. And yeah, just so encouraged about things being able to fix better than we expected in the past. And that's the cool thing about how the body works when it gets the right situation. Lynn is with us and Oscar is here too. Oscar Morales, good to see you. My grandfather's name was Oscar and it could have been my middle name. I think it's a really cool name. I don't hear it as much. It's a it's a good, good, classic, solid name, like it. <laughs> so yeah, uh, nice to see everyone. Uh, Joanne's here from Maryland. Good to see you, Joanne. Nice to see you there. Joanne was out here in person a little over a year or so ago. We had one of our retreats here. Oscar from Columbia. Okay, way cool. So some topics. Uh, the last podcast we had, Dr. Gabrielle Lyons joined me, and we talked about protein requirements and the whole, the whole protein controversies. And it's a fascinating topic. You know, I think a lot about the relevance of protein to uh, you know, overall health, satiety, body composition, and also about its impact upon the environment and the ethics of protein, different forms of that. So yeah, fascinating topic and so many angles to that. It was nice to talk to Dr. Lyon. She's actually been a researcher and published some work along human needs for protein and how protein affects us at a health level. Harmony is here mentioning about the iodine information. Yeah, you're welcome, glad that was helpful. Bethany's with us, Marilyn's back. Good to see you guys. So I'll keep my eye open for some big, big questions. Welcome, Holly. <clears throat> and the protein was one. And this is interesting. There's always a lot of assumptions with protein that it has to mean meat, has to mean animal protein, and not so much. The data's pretty strong that plant proteins can be really useful. You know, when you're only consuming plant proteins, it's, uh, let me back up a little bit. Uh, there's protein deficiency and then protein at optimal levels for maintaining muscle mass, for preventing a lot of the harm of aging, and for maintaining good metabolic rate. And protein deficiency, yeah, very easy to avoid. And anyone who's plant-based, if they're eating enough food, they'll likely not be protein deficient. So just Put that worry aside, no big issues there. But protein for optimal health in those ways, it's a little trickier because that becomes then not just how much do you get, but how much you get compared to fats and carbs. And the pitfall is that uh, <clears throat> if you get way too much fats and carbs relative to protein, some of the benefits go away. And you can do it on a plant-based diet, no doubt about that. It takes a little more planning and thought, but you totally can do it. And However, if your diet is somewhat mixed, if you are a uh, flexitarian and you've got some mixture of plant proteins and animal proteins, in those cases, you get a lot more mileage out of smaller amounts of animal proteins. You know, plant proteins, when they're there, with small amounts of animal protein, they become a lot more effective and you've got a lot more leeway on things. And that's personally how I eat. There's really no food categories that I completely avoid. And I don't see that there's data showing that animal foods in the context of a good diet are harmful, but I do see data about plant foods being helpful. So I do a mixture of those and, and yeah, that's probably easiest and, and certainly you'll get the benefits of protein in both aspects of that. The amounts that show up in terms of your best metabolism, best body composition are often more than, often more than you would expect. And it's somewhere around a gram of protein per pound of lean body weight per day. When you do the math on that, for most of it, it ends up being about you know, 90, 
130 grams, somewhere around there. So three, three, four solid servings per day is often a typical range. And that's of more protein dense foods. So yeah. So we here's the question rolling. And oh, Virginia's with us from Alaska. That's way cool, Virginia. Uh, not, not visited there, but if you want to get up there sometime, my son was just showing me some videos of a person who was doing these long backpacking trips and just showing phenomenal scenery. So yeah, destination I'd love to, love to get to soon. Christy was asking about helpful advice for um, uh, advice for diet low low in iron. Helpful diet for low iron. So Christy, yeah, let me give you a good answer. And I wrote I wrote on this <clears throat> in some pretty good detail recently. And I'll put that link up here if I can find that easily, so you can have that. But I'll give you the synopsis of it as well. So if you're low in iron, um, yeah, let me see if this is not that post. Here we go. Yeah, deep dive in iron. I'm copying this link address. I'm putting that up on Facebook for you, Chrissy. I'm going to reply right here. Boom. Okay. So that's up. Okay, let me go back. There. Ha. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a little bit tech slow sometimes, but I'm happy when I can make it work. So yeah, so Chrissy, from your name, I'm going to assume you're a female. And if you're menstruating, it's not uncommon to be low in iron just from normal menstrual loss. If you're not a female or if you're not menstruating, it is worth sorting out why you would be low in iron. That could be a concern. If you were a 50 year old dude like yours truly, <laughs> you want to know why you were low in iron. But, and something I learned too in writing that article that I shared was that I was just talking before about plant proteins and animal proteins. It's actually not a bit much of a thing for iron as I would have thought that it would be. You know, a lot of the plant sources of iron, they're less bioavailable, but some of them are so much higher, they've got a lot of iron present that the bioavailability ends up being a wash. You know, white beans, for example. And plus, with plant iron, there's a range of absorption like this. With animal iron, maybe this makes sense, the range is kind of like this. So they overlap. And plant iron, you can absorb less if you need less. Animal iron, don't have as much control that way. So, so yeah, being vegetarian or plant-based is not as big of a deal for iron deficiency, not as clear of an explanation. Uh, if someone's low in iron and you're menstruating, it could be just that. Uh, dietary sources, you know, no big secrets there. There, there really is the main thing as far as uh, heme iron, non-heme iron, some of the big foods. White beans were one of the ones that did surprise me in terms of the actual amounts after you figure in bioavailable iron. And then of course, Red meat was a little further down than you would guess on the list. I put a pretty good list in that article that I referenced and I posted there. Uh, you can find some types of shellfish quite high up in iron, so lots of foods that way. Of course, the greens have that as well. <clears throat> a little hoarse here, my apologies. Um, but the thought is really, you know, why are you low, knowing why you're low. And in most cases, with your diet, you, it's hard to make up for a deficiency. It's not too tough to maintain your iron on a good diet, but if you are low, the math works against you. So if you're low enough to have it show up low on blood tests, that article that I sent a link on, you can actually figure out how many milligrams your body is missing out on. And it's between about 500 and 2,000, which is a lot. So when your diet is optimized as much as possible for iron, you might get an extra half a milligram per day in your system. So if you're 500 milligrams low, that's a thousand days. That's, you know, three years or so. Hey, there's a, here's a dear friend who just popped on. Looks like that's Stan Fidel. Nice to see you, Stan. Hope you're doing great. Uh, yeah, so if you're in that range of 500 milligrams, which is like the most minor deficiency that'll show up on a blood test, that's gonna take you three years to build that if things work well. And that's not as practical. So we think then about at least iron supplementation. And iron supplementation, one thing that's counterintuitive is that uh, there's, there's how much you absorb and how badly your stomach side effects are. And that's the big thing for most people, is just how well you tolerate it through your intestinal tract. And a slight majority of people, if they do take any version of iron that's enough to be helpful, they will have gastrointestinal side effects. So not everyone, but a slight majority will. And there's a lot of forms of iron in the market and the ones that are often the lowest in side effects are just really low potency. And that's why they're lower in side effects. There's no, there's no free lunch, so to speak. There's none that have enough to be really helpful, but don't bother anyone's stomach. 
Probably the closest thing that way would be iron bis glycinate, which is why I use that one and recommend that one. We've got that in our store. And with it, the maximal absorbed dose is probably around uh, 200 milligrams per day. So like our iron chelate, uh, 200 milligrams is six capsules. Now the interesting thing, if you are someone that gets stomach side effects, they are much lower if you take iron in a single dose and in alternating days. So what I mean by that is today is um, today's Monday. So I'm, a, I'm an endurance athlete these days, I'm a runner specifically, and runners are in the groups that are prone to get low in iron. And it's not even just athletes or endurance athletes, but it's runners. So something about your foot slamming on the ground a lot, you actually break some red blood cells. So one of the things I do take now is I do take some iron. I run low in that. And what I do is I take six capsules in one sitting away from food on alternating days. So I'll take some tomorrow, and I didn't take any today. But in terms of efficacy, it's, it's crazy, but it's just as effective. If I were to take six capsules twice a day, every single day, it's identically as effective to take six capsules once a day, every other day. There's no loss in efficacy, but there's a really big drop in stomach side effects. So if it bothers your stomach, you can take a, a solid dose, which is about 200 milligrams or six capsules of iron bisglycinate on alternating days and pretty minimal for stomach side effects that way. I won't go into the details. I talked about some of that in the post, but there's a carrier protein that absorbs iron. And if you give it a day's rest, you'll absorb more than you would otherwise. And you'll also have a lot fewer side effects from that. So there's that. Then the next step up we think about is iron infusions. So if you are low, on that higher end of the range, uh, 750, 1,000, 2,000 milligrams, you really want to think about iron infusions because the pills, they will also take you know, most of a year or many years to get you built up again, and it's just too slow. And then the last thing is, Christy, if you are here because of thyroid disease, please do know that a good chunk of people with thyroid disease do have autoimmune gastritis. Now, I touched on that in that recent post on iron, but also I've made a much more detailed post about that in a follow-up uh, post because that was an important topic. And it's also been called thyrogastric syndrome because it is so common amongst those with thyroid disease. And I'm gonna put that link up here to the one about thyrogastric syndrome, just more, more things to be aware of. The important part about that is if one did have that, uh, you're going to spin your wheels taking iron pills. They just will not work, nor will a dietary change work for that. It does take infusions to make a difference, and they're life-changing for those that do have it. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, follow-up comments. Let me keep on going here. Uh, Harmony, I have Hashimoto's. Any links or tips for sleep apnea? On occasion, I jerk awake over and over. I think it's hormone-related. Yeah, awesome question, Harmony, and let me give you a link as well, and also just a quick off-the-cuff answer. And when I wrote this, I'm trying to think, if the home tests were available or not when I wrote this, I'm not sure, but Harmony, this is for you. I'm putting this up in Facebook right now. And apnea, I'm glad you thought about that. Uh, many people assume that it's only a disease of men with massive amounts of body fat, you know, that it's only older guys that have big bellies that get apnea. And it's not true, you know, it's not even the age, the gender, the body size. Those things do raise the risk, but not as much as you would expect. You know, it's actually really common to see women of all sizes develop apnea and of all ages, so common thing. And the cool thing is that there are now tests you can do at home uh, Harmony, there's one that the IH docs can provide via telemedicine to where it's so cool. You get this kit that just attaches to your phone and you've got some things you, uh, the cannula, the nasal cannula you wear at night and a chest strap and you just sleep at home in your own bed in a normal situation. It's not going to a weird lab somewhere. And the device via the phone uploads the data. The docs can help interpret that. And if there are any needs for apnea treatment, they can guide you on that. So easy thing to sort out. Uh, some, one of the easy treatments that helps a lot for people is just, just side sleeping, just learning to sleep on your side. In some cases, that's as helpful as CPAP machines can be. And they even make tools, a uh, tool, it's a fancy word. They make t-shirts that you can stuff a tennis ball and it holds a tennis ball right in the middle of your back. And that, 
the idea is that when you lie on it, your thumb kind of go up back on your side. It's kind of uncomfortable. And they started making those 100 years ago, and they still make them. They're actually really effective. So those are some of the things that are in that article that I mentioned. But yeah, it could be, could be apnea. It's a good thing to think about. It could be other factors, too. That's a big one. Let me grab one here. Um, Apothecary, Roski. Do you think it's safe to attend a Zumba class at a gym? My teacher is starting a class back this week. It's a small gym in a closed classroom at the gym. So yeah, so I'm glad you asked, do I think? <laughs> because the only honest answer anyone can give you should start with, do they think? <laughs> and there's, we've got no hard data on this. We hear about social distancing, right? And the six foot rule, the two arm length rule. Well, that's not the same when you're walking on a trail versus sitting side by side for long periods of time in a closed space. And then if you're huffing and puffing in an enclosed space with a bunch of people, honestly, I wouldn't do it, you know? This is a, it is a real thing. I just wrote about this. It's sad, but the, the current pandemic has made natural medicine almost have a civil war. There's many who think that this is not a real thing. I've been amazed, but there are many, many health experts, many that I know who, I would have never guessed this, they don't believe the germ theory is real. They, they don't believe that germs cause illness, which, yeah, it, that's true. It's in the 20th, 21st century. Many don't buy into the germ theory just yet. Many think this is, is a conspiracy, a cover-up, and, you know, I, I won't go into details right now because no one's been able to do that for themselves, but in our IH family, we had an immediate family member that just passed away from COVID oh, a little over a week ago, and it's a tragic thing, and it, we... You know, the, we saw the we saw it play out. The person's on the ventilator. Their family members are away from them. It's it's so real. And I have countless friends who are healthcare workers, and they're seeing these things firsthand. And and it is real. There's a paper that just came out suggesting that the version that we have in the U.S. may be more infectious than the version that's been in the rest of the world. So we don't know that much about it. And there have been a lot of healthy people who have taken very ill from this. You know, one of my friends who's a very young doctor, a major doctor, she's been public about her plight. She developed a case, I think it was March, at the very beginning of this, and she's, I'm guessing, her mid-30s and healthy as you could be, and she's not recovered by any means. She's still greatly set back from this, so I wouldn't, yeah, some think maybe they want to go get it so it's done. I wouldn't advise that, and I would avoid the risk for sure. You know, and it's, it's tough because there, there's so much benefit to being around other people. We need that, like, as much as we need air and sunlight, but it's not safe for us and others. So that's my two cents. The, the CDC does have a few more detailed guidelines on what your safety is based upon indoor, outdoor, proximity, numbers of people, numbers of duration. But yeah, being in a class in a small gym would be a risky situation. And many could be symptomatic, and I'm sorry, it could be pre-symptomatic and feeling fine, but still expose others there. And yeah, the waves are going back up again. I don't know what stage you're in, but I'm in Arizona and it's crazy here. You know, we've got so many new cases after we open back up again and the last big holiday. Hey, Elvira's back again. Good to see you. Nice to see you back. Okay. So that was that. You know, I struggled on how much energy to put onto COVID versus onto thyroid care. I've been trying to strike balance that way so i'm certainly welcome receptive to feedback but that was the that was the main response to that one okay let me go back on to some of the questions that have been coming in i'm keeping an eye on facebook and on instagram and appreciate you hanging out with me and trying to do my best to give some good detailed answers to questions um huh virginia had rai and hysterectomy over 20 years ago so radioactive iodine for those that might not know so what that would be is Virginia likely had Graves' disease or less likely toxic nodular goiter. She had an overactive thyroid. And so what, what's done is uh, she would have been put on a low iodine diet for one or two weeks and then given a dose of radioactive iodine. And after a low iodine diet, the thyroid really sucks up every bit of iodine in circulation. And by and large, that's where radioactive iodine goes in the body, especially when the thyroid is hungry for it. And that's used to intentionally destroy thyroid tissue when it's overactive. So that was the idea. Uh, 
weight issues, fatigue, also reached until my light base was high and had CT scan, everything looked good, what could it be? Hmm. So I'm assuming, Virginia, you're talking about the weight issues and fatigue. So light base was high. So Virginia, light base being high, that suggests some proclivity towards pancreatitis. And there's acute and there's chronic pancreatitis. But light base is one of the enzymes the pancreas secretes and it squirts it into the small intestine and it joins up with secretions from the liver at that point. And what happens is that if there is any blockage, any congestion in the liver or the pancreas, light base can, it's still being made, but it might end up going back in the bloodstream rather than into the intestinal tract. And a little bit of it does go in the bloodstream, but more of it, more of it does, we think about there being some level of resistance along the way for the pancreatic secretions to get released in the intestinal tract. And that can be from many versions of pancreatic inflammation, pancreatic blockage, that can be from early fatty liver, that can be relevant, but there are versions of acute and chronic pancreatitis that would need to be ruled out. If the CT said everything looked good, um, you likely do not have advanced fatty liver disease. I'm guessing you would have mentioned that. I'm guessing they would have mentioned that. So what happens is that if fatty liver disease has more than, uh, more than a third of the liver cells being stuck together, it starts to show up on ultrasound or on CT. Now, if there's fewer than a third of the cells that are fibrosed, there's nothing to see. So that doesn't mean that you don't, it's a double negative, I'm sorry for that for the grammarians, but it doesn't mean you don't have fatty liver. There's no more accurate way to say that. Yeah, so you, you may still have fatty liver, but you don't likely have advanced fatty liver. But that's one of the more common things, early fatty liver, that can cause elevations of pancreatic enzymes. And in terms of that, that can also relate to weight issues and fatigue for sure. Uh, Virginia, I'm thinking about some quick links to send your way. Actually, I'm gonna, hmm, I'll send this over for just some free information for you. Uh, here's an article about fatty liver, and it tells you how you can make sense of the likelihood of that based upon some easy measurements you can do at your own home, and also some things were probably on your recent, recent blood tests, some things you can probably find out about pretty well. But that's one thing to consider. But uh, another answer, Virginia, the, the metabolism reset diet was basically how you reverse fatty liver. So if you've gone through the process and it looks like your liver were the culprit and other things were ruled out, that's just a guidebook on how to go about reversing that. Most months we do a free version of that diet online. So that's metabolismresetchallenge.com. Let me get that link too. And we've got one coming up again pretty quick. If I could spell better. <laughs> There we go. There's that link. Copy link address back to Facebook. And yeah, you can always join a free challenge and learn more about how that works. You can grab the book on Amazon or wherever. But if that's where what the culprit was, that would be one of the best things to do. And the cool thing is that it can exactly cause those symptoms you described. It can cause lipase and or amylase to elevate. You may not have the elevated liver enzymes. You may not have obvious findings in your CT, but it could still be there. Um, Put the fatty liver link here, please. Yes, I will. In fact, I'll make a note. This, is, this makes me nuts because I can't put links live on Instagram like I can on Facebook, but I'll get those up after the fact. And let me put <laughs> something in a weird position so I don't forget that. So, okay, I'm gonna cover over. Ha, huh, I'll see that and I will remember. So, got you covered. <laughs> I saw a few questions here on Instagram too. Let me grab some of these over here. And I said we get a follow-up comment really quick. Yeah, Apothecary, care. Thank you, Dr. Christensen. I appreciate your answering. Wanted to go to Zumba, but with Hashimoto, 67 years old. Sure, I should follow your advice. Yeah, just just so you know, just so everyone knows for sure, Hashimoto's doesn't raise your risk for complications or for catching COVID. Um, being human, there are enough risks for catching it and having complications. Uh, but Hashimoto's doesn't change that for you. If your thyroid levels were off, meaning you were had too little thyroid hormone or way too much thyroid hormone, those things could affect some facet of your risk of catching the illness or having complications. But having autoimmune thyroiditis by itself 
it doesn't change those risks. So just one, one nice positive thing to, to pass along there. Okay, now going forward again. Oh, Byra had one. Um, how was so helpful? Thank you. Question about getting my labs done. Mentioned last time, best time to get them done within the, okay, uh, what if someone, if I'm in regular? Yeah, so thank you, 39 cycles, like twice a month. So I wish there was an easier way to say this one too. So 10 to 20 days, that's the time not to get the labs done <laughs> between day 10 to 20. So uh, menstrual cycle, first day of actual solid consistent flow, we call day one. And yeah, first 10 days, good time to test. Uh, last eight days, seven days, good time to test. Middle 10 to 20 days, not a good time to test. And what's going on is the, the, est the estradiol pre-ovulation spike and then the progesterone surge, they cause the secretion of thyroid binding globulin. <clears throat> and that's something that it just changes your thyroid scores. It makes them goopy during that window of time. So it's one of the many reasons people always chase around their thyroid levels because they're not getting tested consistently. If Elvira, if your cycles are irregular, super easy answer for you. Uh, have your lab order ready to go. <clears throat> and once your period starts, take a couple steps. So one step is first day of your period, stop taking your supplements, um, things that contain biotin. Also probiotics, I learned about this recently. Probiotics can skew your thyroid peroxidase levels. So yeah, so no vitamins that contain biotin or never take ones with iodine anyway, but yeah, stop, just make it simple. Just stop taking supplements for three days, all supplements for three days, and then get your test done. So that'll put you like day three, day four. So yeah, during your first 10 days, you're fine. And if your cycles are erratic, you don't always know when your last seven or eight days are, but you do know when the first few days are. So yeah, just test during your period. And since you may not know when it's going to start, that's why I said stop taking your pills day one, because you know when day one is. And then, yeah, three, four days later, go get your test on and you'll be golden. So hopefully that's, that's helpful. And just a little more detail for those two about testing. Uh, a lot of talk about getting tests done, laboratory draw stations. And this is kind of odd, but you know, you can always check out your area, things might be different. But I saw someone just comment about Arizona and where, where we are with, with our risks or whatnot. Where was that comment? Yeah, Joanne, thank you for that, Joanne. It's, it is spiking in Arizona, which really is spiking in Phoenix, you're right. It's out of control. And so the lab draw stations in the first portion of this pandemic, when they were taking people in, they were really keeping people apart. Like you were in there by yourself, basically with you and just a few lab techs. I have heard in some areas that they are taking in more people at a time. So it might not be as easy as it was. There are ways you can safely do thyroid tests from home nowadays, which is really cool. And to be really detailed, the tests are good for TSH. They're, they're good for the hormones and they're, they're adequate for the hormones, but they're, they're decent for the antibodies. So be precise, they're good for thyroid peroxidase, but not for antithyroglobulin and not for thyroglobulin. So the two things they can't cover, but they do cover all the rest. And you can do it from home and drop in the mail. So that, that's an option. Uh, in many cases, if you're on treatment, honestly, the TSH does give you a large sense as to whether your treatment is too high, too low, or in the ballpark. There's not always benefit in checking the antibodies and the free hormones each time. They are good things to be aware of and they are important at the time of diagnosis, but they're not things you always have to test with every single blood test. So yeah, in many cases, just a TSH, if it is someone who's been on meds and they're, and they're curious about what their progression is, in many cases, that is adequate. And that's a quick and easy one that does work well for home options, so yeah. Um, how I read, any specific diet you recommend for hypothyroidism? Yeah, awesome question, you know. <laughs> the book's almost ready. <laughs> it's getting really close. It's on pre-purchase for Amazon right now, but the, I've written five books now, and the first one that was in this series was about the adrenal glands and about how you can adjust your carbohydrate intake and change cortisol because of that and get your cortisol levels right again by timing your carbohydrates. Then I just mentioned the metabolism reset diet, and you can reverse fatty liver, boost your metabolism back up. So next up is the thyroid reset diet. And yeah, we, I can do the title reveal. We've got the cover reveal now on Amazon, but the, the gist of it is getting yourself into a safe range of iodine. It's like not too much, not too little. 
And there's a window that can reverse thyroid disease a really big percent of the time and very consistent for reversing thyroid symptoms. So yeah, exciting stuff. And that's out in January, but I'm putting a lot more data around that in these coming months, giving more ideas about it. So yeah, thank you for that. Uh, a couple of ones that came in, some related questions here. Chrissy, how do you know you are low? I assume, Chrissy, we were talking about iron before. Let me scroll back. Yeah, you're talking about iron. So Chrissy, that, that post I put up, I talked about, so there's, there's basically uh, a couple of levels, a couple of types of iron deficiency. One they call IDA, which is, I'm sorry, LID, which is latent iron depletion. And that means that your iron levels have gotten low, but it's not compromised your ability to make hemoglobin or make red blood cells. Next up we call IDA or iron deficiency anemia. That's now lower to where it does impact how well you can make hemoglobin and how well you can make blood cells. And then the other thing, which is not so much a sequence, but more so like just a different thing in the same category, is anemia of chronic disease, or ACD. So LID, um, ACT, and, <laughs> and IDA, <laughs> a lot of acronyms. So the anemia of chronic disease, there's a lot of ways by which when someone is ill, they've got chronic inflammation in their body, they, they intentionally move a lot of iron out of their blood and into storage. So they'll often have anemias, they may have low hemoglobin, low red blood count, but they may have high ferritin levels. And those are cases to where it's not really iron overload. It could look like iron overload plus iron deficiency, but that's more so anemia of chronic disease. And that's really sorting out and managing what is that chronic disease. In some cases, it helps to treat the anemia. In many cases, it does not. That's very individualized. So yeah, so the, the latent, Iron depletion is the earliest stage, and that one shows up by ferritin is getting low, but hemoglobin, hematocrit, and red blood counts, they are still normal at that stage. And this is the fascinating thing about thyroid disease, is that there's a lot of ways by which iron and thyroid hormones need one another. It works both directions. And what is low for ferritin for someone with thyroid disease is completely different. There's really strong data that shows that you can, and this is kind of odd too, because the level at which causes symptoms to show up is not the same level that causes symptoms to go away. So I don't know, let's say that, let's say that there's a, there's a four foot pool and you're five feet high. If you go down one foot, you can't breathe. And if you go up one foot, you can breathe again, right? So it doesn't work like that with ferritin and thyroid symptoms. It's how low you have to get to develop symptoms seems to be somewhere around 60 nanograms per mil, somewhere around 60, but then how high do you have to get to reverse the symptoms? It's higher than 60, it might be 100. There's some papers saying that some people need to get above 100 to reverse symptoms. So yeah, so if you get low in iron and you get tired from that, you may get yourself well back into the normal range and still be tired. And you might start thinking, oh, am I on the wrong thyroid medication? Am I, you know, is there something else happening altogether? And it might still just be the iron, and it's completely bizarre. Um, hair loss is big that way too. You might need to get below 60 to cause hair loss, but you might, might need to get above 100 to reverse hair loss. So that's a really odd asymmetry with ferritin and thyroid disease and thyroid symptoms. But, but yeah, check out that post. You can figure out if you've got a few recent labs. It actually gives you some flow charts showing which category you might be in. And there's actually a lot of subcategories. It's more granular than that. And then you can take the subcategories, go to a different part in that blog post, and you can know exactly how many milligrams of iron you need to close that gap. And it's usually between about 500 and 2,000. So yeah, if you're on that higher side, and it also talks through more what might be the likely culprits. Now you can sort out what is really causing that. If you're a gal that's a petite gal with heavy periods, there may be no need for a further explanation. It could be just that. But if the periods aren't as heavy, diets very rich in iron uh, yeah it could be worth digging further and if you're if you're if there's not a clear explanation though you need an explanation for any kind of an iron deficiency so taking a peek at more comments oh Byra, <laughs> you're welcome thank you for the feedback melody ordering pre-ordering now that's awesome thank you for that yeah i'm so excited about this book i honestly think this is going to be like the biggest wave maker and game changer of all of them by far i i got going on this book and 
you know, I've, I've been treating thyroid disease. I did nonstop for 20 years, and that started like, shoot, 24 years ago. It was been like a whole focus for a long time. And when the publisher asked me to do a thyroid book, I'm like, well, sure, I could just sit down and write a thyroid book. And then I thought about it, and I, but I, and I had, you know, one of, my, one of my mentors back in the day, he, he talked about how for some people in which they feel confidence, they feel a skill set, it can be tempting to just do things off the cuff. And he said, yeah, you could probably just show up and write a book on this. You could just show up and do a speech on that. He said, just because you could doesn't mean you should. You know, the audience still deserves your best. And even if that means going beyond what you know and digging deeper, even if you already could do really well, you know, your audience deserves you to do as good as you can and just dig as deep as possible. Even if your off the cuff is really good, you should still strive for more. And I took his advice to heart. And yeah, I spent almost full time, um, probably like 30 hours a week for a year, reading all the medical literature on thyroid disease. And it just blew my mind. You know, the, the outline that I had for the book going into it, I completely scrapped. And all the things that I thought I was going to say, I did draft them, but I'm using almost very, very, very little, little, little of them because a lot of those things are things that I have said or others have said, but I found a brand new message that no one had talked about and it needed to come out. So that's what this book is, and I'm just super jazzed to share it with you guys. So thank you for that feedback. Um, and here's from Stan. I gotta take a peek and see if I can make some sense here. Uh, good to see you. I've had shortness of breath the last 10 months. Pulmonologist said my lungs are fine. Cardiologist says my heart is good. Any ideas regarding what's causing it? Boy, shortness of breath. Well, you know, first off, Stan, I'm glad you saw a cardiologist and a pulmonologist. And like you mentioned, it's been the last 10 months. And Stan, if you're still here, uh, the, the, my, my MO with these is I'd love to get follow-up questions and you know dig deeper and do better if I can. So I'll take this off the cuff, but if you want to give me more details in response to my initial responses, I'll watch for that and I'll hang on to this thread and go real deep with it. So thankfully, those sorts of things are healthy. Uh, I don't remember uh, in the past discussing this with you, but you know, apnea is a really big consideration. That one came up recently. Someone asked about that not too long ago. And you know, 10 months, so when I'm hearing that, I'm thinking this was a change. You know, if someone's like, it came on really gradually, it's always been there, you can think about general fitness or a lot of things along those lines, but it came on over a clear time frame. It, we do think differently about that. Uh, body weight can be a factor, so body mass index. And this is, it can be relative to apnea, but even in the daytime. So, and it's not even total size, it's more so just weight right around the diaphragm. So some people put on more weight in the liver just below the diaphragm. And that it actually grows up and it takes away a lot of the room for the diaphragm to move. And sometimes you can guess that based upon, you know, pounds or inches. Sometimes you really wouldn't. Some people that aren't all that large might have some extra weight just around the diaphragm. But you can generally guess that if you look at height to waist ratio. So if one's height is less than twice one's belly button circumference, we start thinking about there being more pressure on the mid-body around the liver and the diaphragm. So Stan, I, I think I'm I think I'm maybe a little bit taller than you, but easy math. I'm I'm not quite six feet, but it's easy math to say that I am. So yeah, six feet, if I were 72 inches tall, 72, half of that, 36, I'd want that to be well under 36 inches. And if it weren't, I'd be at risk for having some pressure on my diaphragm. So that can do it. Also, that same issue of some visceral weight, it does release compounds called adipokines, which are amongst the most toxic inflammatory cytokines in the body. So if there aren't any more obvious chronic degenerative medical reasons, you know, a few, a few spare pounds can do that. And that can be why many see, it's funny because they debate as to whether or not exercise helps lung function because you exercise your lungs or because you make more room for your lungs. You know, you drop a few pounds and your lungs can move better. They're not really sure which is the biggest factor, but for sure it can be quite helpful. And Stan, I'm gonna dig up a video that I posted about a breathing technique. That's just a really good one. And if you're, if you're clear with your pulmonologist and cardiologist, that can be a great thing to add in. But yeah, consider doing one of the metabolism resets. And if, if the height to waist thing is relevant, that could be a factor for it. And, and also just expanding as much uh, aerobic type activity and 
good things along those lines? <laughs> oh, yeah, hold on. Dr. C, don't think about retiring anytime soon with brain fog. I have to reread, re listen, and take notes. <laughs> so I'm sorry. So uh, if you're talking about before the, the 20 years, the 24 years, so uh, yeah, I've not done direct patient care since 2016. So coming up on four years this year. But as far as this kind of stuff and writing or whatnot, I can keep this up long term. <laughs> and, and I love patient care so much, but the difficulty was it was hard for me to spend time training my doctors and really helping them and guide them. And also I was a bottleneck, so that's, that was the choice away from that. I, I did do the retreats for a while. Those were a blast. You know, right now with social distancing, the in-person retreats are an option, but I love any feedback from people. I'm toying with the idea of doing a, a virtual retreat and perhaps late summer in the fall. So with the retreats, basically I take on a small group of people that all become new patients and I look at their history. Uh, I get tons of detailed information from them. We do a lot of detailed testing on them and figure out exactly where they are and what their needs are. And I take over their care. I create a game plan for them. Then my team carries out that, that care moving forward. But we speak in person, uh, we, we meet as a group, I talk to everyone as a group, I also speak to people about their individual situations. And with the advancements of telemedicine and with the broader legal scope of that, which just changed during this, this pandemic, and then with the concerns of social connections during the pandemic, yeah, I'm toying with doing one of those as a virtual format. We could do a, a Zoom call, you know, half a dozen, a dozen people tops, and just spend a couple of days going deep into everyone's individual situation. I would then initiate their care and take their next steps, get them going. And, but yeah, toying with that as an idea for later in the year. So I'll welcome any feedback from anyone about that, but might be something coming coming up. But but yeah, no, no plans to retire. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> I, uh, you know, that time I spent researching and reading was just so much fun. I, I learned so much and and I love that, you know, it's, I don't, I don't think that I'm the one that has the best answers, but I'm, I'm one that works hard to try to get things right, you know, and I'll, and I'll keep digging and keep working and not assume that it's all done and all figured out. There's always more things to learn. So that's, that's the cool part about that. Okay, let me grab another question or two. Uh, let's see. Devin, I need iron infusions, but I live in Texas. It's been challenging finding a good facility that offers recommended infusions. I'm considering visiting Scott's list to receive infusion treatment. What do you recommend when there are barriers like this during COVID? Yeah, Devin, totally valid concern. And you know, it's something that it, it does it does frustrate me because when I wrote that piece, it just became so I'm sorry, the iron piece, the recent iron piece, the data about how many people have varying versions of iron deficiency is just massive. You know, with thyroid disease, it's probably 84% of more people that have that. And then if we see how many just aren't ever going to absorb oral iron, they've got atrophic gastritis, that's about a third, you know, 30 to 40% of thyroid disease. So they're, they need this, this is essential. And then when you look at how crazy effective and how safe the current generation of iron infusions are, there's just no reason not to. And, and then the other part that frustrates me is it is a struggle to find that. I acknowledge that. There aren't centers doing that in all parts of the country. And it is something too to where they are safe when they're done properly, but the level of setup and training and staffing and equipment, there are a lot of places that do B12 shots, vitamin C IVs, that's fine. Iron's different. You know, iron does take a higher level of of proficiency to do it effectively and safely. And not all not all do that. So yeah, a lot of folks need it. It works well. It's super safe when it's done well, but it's not all that available. And I get that that's a bottleneck. The really cool thing though is that now with the current versions, you can do a couple treatments and be done. I mean, you can map out, like Devin, I mentioned that article I posted, you can see how many milligrams you might need that can be done in a couple days, you know, like, like, a, like two or three treatments back to back, and you're done, you're all finished. And if it's the worst case scenario to where you've got advanced atrophic gastritis, maybe you're losing blood from a heavy period, you might have to top off every 18 months or something. So yeah, it's that's about the worst it gets, and that's not too bad. 
Uh, yeah, Adita is saying here, I think I said that right, yeah, my doctor does not include iron army therapy. And that, that's good because it is a more advanced thing to administer and many don't have the training and the setup and the safety requirements for that. But in the right setup, it's ridiculously safe and very effective and just life-changing for those who need it. So Devin, if you are considering that, yeah, please do know that we are doing our infusions. Uh, we're, we're doing things so safely. Our, our staff is following all CDC guidelines and then some. They're, they're wearing gowns and masks and shields, and we take in one person at a time for infusions. It's like just super, super cautious, but yeah, we can do a good job with that. Julie, um, asking about the thyroid plan. Yeah, so there's a new one we're just rolling out here and just kind of testing, testing this one and put this together to go along with the new book. Julie, would love to see you and help you out with that. We're also doing, um, I think this email just went out. We'll do a quick session talking about that in a few more days, taking some more questions, but so take a look at that. Lorene, so I will put my two pieces of question together. How much protein for my body would you have for someone recovering from Cushing's disease and severe muscle wasting? I'm in PT, I do resistant work also. It just seems like a losing battle to restore my muscle. Any other supplements that would help? I am off steroids for recovering from Cushing's disease. So yeah, so Lorene, awesome question. So Cushing's disease, Cushing's syndrome. Now this can be your body making too much stress hormone, or this can be the effects of you taking medical versions of cortisol, cortisol analogs, prednisone, things along those lines. That does cause major muscle wasting. It does make it slow to recover. In terms of protein per pound of body weight, uh, in those types of cases, we think about a gram per pound. Now, the distinction is that general health, we think more about a gram per pound of lean body mass. In cases like that, we think about a gram per pound of total body mass. So it's a little bit higher. And we think a lot about just complete high quality proteins too. So Lorraine, um, you know, easy math. If a woman were just making this up 150 pounds, she would do well with 150 grams per day. And that's a lot, you know, I'll, I'll own that. There's, we used to think there was big gaps on how much protein you could absorb at once. No one really thinks that much anymore. So you can have quite a few grams at one time, but we do see that it makes a difference. What are the biggest gaps you have between your protein intake? So it's not that you have to have it spread out throughout the day because you won't absorb it otherwise, but you do want to have it where there aren't gaps of more than about four hours. So yeah, so post Cushing's, you want to have a good solid dose of protein, at least about like 25 grams, not more than four hours apart. And yes, definitely with your resistance training. And I don't know, Lorraine, your situation hormonally, but your general androgen load, your amount of testosterone, of DHEA, that can also be a factor for your recovery from Cushing's. So yeah, and then with strength training, we think a lot about focusing on your main muscle groups. You know, so much of our muscle mass is butt and thighs, <laughs> you know, all, all genders, all ages. That's the biggest part of our body's muscle mass. So there's not a single exercise that has more of a whole body muscle growth effect than, than like squats or deadlifts. So those things are hugely effective. And of course, definitely when you have muscle wasting, good stuff to do with your physical therapy for close guidance and proper form. But yeah, think about move, work the big muscles, you know, use weights that are challenging for you. Four, six repetitions, three to five sets under your physical therapist's guidance. And think about a gram of good protein per pound of body weight with gaps less than four hours between that while you're awake. And then also just be aware of DHEA, testosterone, your main energy levels they can be suppressed for quite a while post Cushing's also. Okay, um, let me grab one or two more. Hey, Dr. Walker's with, that's awesome. Another friend jumped on, good to see you. Uh, I think this will be my last one. Cat, if large meals are slow to digest, yes, I'm hypothyroid, does that indicate thyrogastric syndrome? So Kat, this is an awesome question. This is something else that is, when people talk about thyrogastric syndrome or atrophic gastritis, they'll often say that there are not typically gastrointestinal symptoms, that most people are asymptomatic. And when I wrote the big paper on that recently, um, it's just not true. You know, that's the commonly held belief that people have no symptoms from that. But upwards of 65% of people that have it 
do have significant digestive symptoms. And the breakdown is that, so, okay, so about 65% have symptoms, and of that group, about 70% have upper GI symptoms, meaning more so what you're describing, uh, fullness, heartburn, upper intestinal gas or bloating, and the remaining, I'm sorry, I won't be precise on these next percentages, but somewhere around the remaining 30%, no, no, okay, 70% has only upper intestinal symptoms. About 30% only has lower intestinal symptoms, um, irregularity, more so lower bowel discomfort or pain, and then somewhere around 20, 30% has a mixture of both. So yeah, so they can be more than 100 because there's overlap. But many do have symptoms from that. And this is something that I wanted to talk about that condition too, because there's a popular idea about, you know, if you can't digest big meals, will you take hydrochloric acid pills? Many will talk about that in functional medicine. And we know that, and or if you're, if you're not, if you're chronically anemic, if you're low in B12, yeah, they tell you to take hydrochloric acid pills. And there probably are some people to whom that would help their symptoms and it might even help their absorption. However, when someone has atrophic gastritis, what's going on is they're not making enough stomach acid. The other thing that's going on is because the parietal cells are damaged, they're also not making enough bicarbonate and mucin. So their stomach is not making acid, but their stomach also cannot protect itself against acid. And the main complication is that they have greater risks for esophageal cancers and stomach cancers. So the last thing that person should ever do is take hydrochloric acid pills. That's exactly the wrong thing to do. Even if, and this is the thing is that you can have things that really do help in the short term that are completely the wrong thing to do in the long term. That's a big example of that. So, so cat, that wouldn't by any means be diagnostic of thyrogastric syndrome, but it could be a suspicious symptom of that. So yeah, I put a link to that article and it talks about, you can screen that pretty well with blood tests. And if the blood tests are abnormal in terms of um, the, oh, gastrin, when there's a fair amount of breakdown of the stomach lining, we see gastrin elevate. And then we will also see parietal cell antibodies show up at one of the earlier indicators. So yeah, so PCA is one of the earliest indicators. Gastrin is a lagging indicator when there's more erosion taking place. And if those are positive, then it may be worth looking at an upper endoscopy for confirming any level of erosion. If they're negative, it's quite like, unlikely you would have the condition. So there are simple blood tests that can screen for it pretty well. And if it's suggestive, then one can look further. So, all right. <laughs> That's about what I had for today. Uh, this is a really cool group today and nice to connect with you guys and had a lot of different topics come up. We talked a bit about COVID, a lot about many thyroid concerns, a bit about iron infusions. So yeah, good to see you guys. Uh, stay tuned, I'll be back next week, if not sooner, but look forward to catching up with you real soon. And thank you for the feedback from those who just made a few comments about the uh, group the group retreat or the group virtual retreat, so to speak. I'll keep thinking about that and I think it'd be a lot of fun. So stay tuned. All right, take great care. Bye-bye.